So I'd like to remind the audience, we also have handouts of the presentation. It will help you to uh, just learn about the presentation, the scale buckle techniques. Uh, these are uh, placed in front. If you guys want, you can please have one for yourself. Okay, so I'll be talking about scleral buckling and can this be actually the first choice for all forms of primary regmatogenous retinal detachments. I have no financial interest. So scleral buckling was the gold standard for a really long time, but gradually there has been a growing shift towards pass plana vitrectomy. A 2017 paper showed that a preference of 83% for vitrectomy and only 5% for scleral buckling. So why this decline? Well, the availability of small gauge instrumentation has made vitrectomy a lot easier, a lot simpler. Less time is spent on scleral buckling by mentors and training programs. There are economic and time factors, no industry support for scleral buckling, and certain misconceptions have creeped in. It's now considered that uh, success rate for scleral buckling is much lower than pass plana vitrectomy. It is considered to have a high complication rate, higher rate of PVR. However, there are no dearth of studies act which actually show that scleral buckling and primary vitrectomy is almost equal in outcome. Does not matter whether it's a fakey chi or a fakey chi or a pseudo fakey chi. The success rate for scleral buckling increases even further if we combine it with pneumatic retinopexy. A Cochrane review which studied 10 randomized control trials from all over the world, including India, Europe, Japan, showed that the results were very similar for pass plana vitrectomy and scleral buckling, irrespective of the status of the lens. In spite of all this evidence, today the situation is that scleral buckling is tried only for young fakic patients with no PVD. So with this background, I come to the purpose of this presentation. It was to evaluate whether the indications of scleral buckling can be extended beyond a few selective cases and to determine the relevance of this procedure in modern day practice. So we did a retrospective case study in our center. We included retinal detachments of all type, fakicardi with PVD, without PVD, pseudo fakicardi with PVD, a fakicardis, and even complicated RDs, like uh, RD with choroidal attachment, very posterior break with uh, fixed fold in one quadrant. A total of 73 eyes of 71 patients were included in the study. So briefly describing the surgical procedure, this was a 72-year-old gentleman with a bullous retinal detachment. He was pseudo -fakic. So if you look at the buckling uh, procedure, the initial few steps like Dr. Jayant mentioned, we go for a 360-degree peritomy followed by isolation of the recti muscle. We have to be careful not to hook the obliques. Once the recti muscles are isolated, we go ahead with cryo and marking of the breaks. It is done using indirect ophthalmoscopy. We use a double freeze thaw technique. Also very important uh, is to mark the breaks on the sclera using a scleral marker. This will help in placing the buckle in the proper place after we have done the cryo. Once the cryo is complete, we then go ahead with suturing of the buckle. So here you can see a violet mark on the sclera. So that actually indicates where the break is. We suture the explant using Ethibond 5.0 suture. These are non-absorbable sutures. I also use a 360 degree belt, 240 belt, all in all my cases of scleral buckling. We uh, use scleral tunnels to put the, exp to the, put the 240 belt in place. Uh, it is passed underneath the scleral tunnels through the groove of the scleral buckle, underneath the recti muscles. And it's tightened using a Watsky sleeve. So how much to shorten I'll be discussing in subsequent slides because that's a very important question. Then we go ahead with the subretinal fluid drainage. It's also very important to maintain pressure on the globe when the subretinal fluid drainage is happening because that helps to prevent any subretinal bleed. We then evaluate the retina to see whether everything's settled or not. And finally, the case is closed. So. This question is very important because the beginners always ask how much should we shorten the band by? For that, we need to go back to our school days where we studied circumference is equal to twice pi r. So if we are planning for an end of millimeter, it means we have to reduce the radius of the globe. So the new circumference will come to twice pi r minus one. So 
it comes to the older circumference minus twice pi. The idea is, does not matter what the size of the globe is, we need an indent of one millimeter, we'll have to shorten the band by two times pi, that is six millimeter. Similarly, for a two millimeter indent, we need to reduce the size of the belt by 12 millimeter. I hope this point is clear. We see this patient did well. Two months after surgery, he had a vision of 624 and the retina was well settled. The same process can be applied even in aphakic retinal detachments. Initial peritomy followed by the buccal, followed by the recti muscle isolation. We then move ahead with cryopexy. And as you can see, the mark is very well prominently placed on the sclera. This helps to put the buccal in the proper place. We use non-absorbable ethibond sutures. And then we go ahead with making the scleral tunnels for attaching the 240 belt. I use 240 belt in all my cases of scleral buccal. This helps to provide support to the vitreous base. It's tightened using a Watsky sleeve. And even in aphakic patients, we can go ahead with the same process of SRF drainage using a needle. The retina is inspected and the case is closed. So this patient also did well with 6-9 vision two months after the surgery. Another important point is if there is a lot of SRF drainage, the globe tends to become very soft. So in those cases, we can actually inject air inside the eye. We try to do a single bubble. However, it might not be possible every time. Here, as you can see, there are multiple bubbles. But in spite of that, finally, I was able to get a single bubble. That helps to provide tamponade to the break. If you are not doing a SRF drainage in case of a superior detachment, you can do a little bit of a core vitrectomy using a MVR port. The eye becomes slightly soft and it provides volume for the air to go in. Once the eye is slightly soft, we can inject an air bubble. In this particular case, I was able to get a single bubble. As you can see, single large bubble that will provide proper tamponade to the break. After that, the port may be sutured. So uh, another case where we have a fixed fold in one quadrant, after the buckle, the retina was attached, the visual acuity improved, and the fixed fold, as you can see, is on top of the buckle. A couple more cases where scleral buckle gave a good result. So this is an interesting case where you can see a star fold right close to the macula. The patient had an inferior dialysis. I did a scleral buckle and two weeks later the retina had attached and the star fold was also beginning to open up. But however, I noticed that the break was still open. So I went ahead and did a barrage laser. Two months later, the star fold is almost totally gone. The visual acuity has improved and you can see the previous barrage laser marks. But even now, the break was still open and I was not really satisfied. So I went ahead and did another row of barrage laser. So there is a very interesting paper by Wong et al. which shows that with a scleral buckle, even with open breaks, the retina can get attached. What happens is Bernoulli's principle comes into play and Bernoulli's principle, like you know, uh, is based on conservation of energy where uh, if, the if the height remains same, the speed of the fluid increases when the space becomes smaller. So what happens is the buckle changes the intraocular currents and that actually helps in drainage of the fluid through the break as soon as the patient becomes mobile. So that's a very interesting paper. I would recommend everyone go through it. Now pushing the limits of scleral buckle. This is a very posterior break as you can see over here with the rolled edges indicating some amount of PVR. So I again went ahead with a scleral buckle and uh, a month later, you can see that the retina is attached. Even though the break was not completely on the buckle, a part of it was on the buckle. Even then, the retina attached very well and the patient regained good vision after a single surgery. So to summarize my results, I included patients of all ages from 12 to 74 years and we had a single surgery primary reattachment rate of 94.5%. Only four patients required a resurgery. We did a vitrectomy in those patients. All patients improved vision, which was significant. 
So even though considered less effective, it has been shown in multiple papers that scleral buckling is actually better in fakie kais, better than pars plana vitrectomy. And also, it's much easier to fix a scleral buckle failure rather than a pars plana vitrectomy failure. However, scleral buckling does induce significant myopia. Even in our case series, the myopia ranged from minus 1 to minus 5. In young patients, accommodation is preserved. In older patients, vitreous is preserved. There is no need of post-operative patient positioning unless you are injecting air or gas. And it's a lot cheaper than pars plana vitrectomy. So to conclude, it's a reliable option, offers single surgery, good visual recovery in a lot of patients, and I believe it should be the first choice for all primary regmatogenous retinal detachments. Thank you very much. Now I have Dr. Avnish with us. Uh, Dr. Vaivav, you'll be going first now? Okay. So Dr. Vaivav will be talking about chandelier-assisted scleral buckling, and uh, his technique actually is probably the key to making people more interested in this surgery and uh, popularizing it among the younger generation all the more. So over to you, Vaivav. Yes, Dr. Himadri, very nice presentation. While Dr. Weber sets his presentation, I have two quick questions. Uh, what percentage uh, is buckle in your current practice right now? 80%. 80%? Yes. That's huge. And uh, uh, the cases that you showed, especially the first one, mm -hmm. there was a huge bullless RD. So any tips for people picking up uh, buckle, uh, how to locate the break in such cases where a bullous component in there is there and you might miss out on breaks also. Okay, so uh, we follow the Linkoff's rule, which very clearly uh, tell you how to exactly find out where the break is. So this was a bullous RD, had a break very superior, close to the 12 o'clock meridian. So the Linkoff's rule helped, but uh, sometimes uh, Linkoff's rule does have exceptions. and. Uh, a good indirect ophthalmoscopy is a prerequisite. That's, that's a skill which we are actually losing. So uh, for all young retina surgeons, I would definitely recommend learn how to do a good indirect ophthalmoscopy. And the only way to learn is by doing